We begin, though, this morning with breaking news out of the White House and the killing of the leader of Al Qaeda in a U.S. drone strike in the Afghan capital, Kabul, over the weekend. President Biden made the announcement last night. Ayman al Zawahiri had been in charge of the terror group since 2011. He took over from Osama bin Laden, who was killed by U.S. forces during a raid in Pakistan. He was widely known as being bin Laden's right hand man and one of the main architects of 9 11. The president confirmed his death, speaking to the nation from the White House. Justice has been delivered, and this terrorist leader is no more. People around the world no longer need to fear the vicious and determined killer. It's my hope that this decisive action will bring one more measure of closure. No day shall erase them from the memory of time, today and every day. We have full coverage this morning. In just a few moments, we'll talk to NBC News military analyst, retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitty. But first, NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian and NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett, who is at the White House. So, Mara, let's start with you. Talk to us about how all this came about. And do we know just how personally involved was the president in this operation? This was the result of a months-long operation by the CIA, Joe. And this all happened over the weekend while, if you might remember, the president had just tested positive again in his rebound positivity and has been isolating at the White House since Saturday morning. The attack happened uh, just before 10 p.m. Eastern Saturday night, so early morning Sunday hours in Afghanistan. A senior official uh, says that the U.S. planned or used an unmanned drone and Hellfire missiles to target uh, the third-floor balcony of a resident apartment building uh, in Kabul. And so this was something that, like I said, was a, a months-long operation, but the president himself made that personal decision uh, just about a week ago. He explained some of his calculus in his announcement last night. After carefully considering the clear and convincing evidence of his location, I authorized a precision strike that would remove him from the battlefield once and for all. And one week ago, after being advised that the conditions were optimal, I gave the final approval to go get him. And the mission was a success. None of his family members were hurt, and there were no civilian casualties. Biden went on to say that he wanted this to be a message to any groups or individuals that might threaten Americans, going on to say, quote, we will find you and take you out. Joe. So, Ken, tell us a little more about El Zawahiri. We know he was a key plotter on 9-11. What all was he responsible for in 21 years after 9-11? What's the significance of his death? Joe, he was one of the intellectual founders of al-Qaeda, and his roots in jihad go back even before the 9-11 attacks. He was responsible, for example, for a brutal attack on the ruins in Luxor, Egypt, that killed children. Uh, and he helped Osama bin Laden found al-Qaeda and mastermind the 9-11 attacks. He was more of the brains behind the operation while uh, bin Laden was the inspirational leader. And then when bin Laden was killed in 2011, he took over the organization and, by all accounts, was not a terribly effective leader, perhaps was not suited for the role of leading uh, such a sprawling organization. And, you know, w while he was uh, the head of it, uh, ISIS splintered off and al the Al Nusra Front in Syria kind of distanced itself from Al Qaeda. And Al Qaeda, you know, was the subject of withering pressure from the United States. And uh, Zawahiri essentially disappeared. So that's what's so remarkable about this is when I talked to my intelligence sources, this was the hardest of hard targets. He was literally gone from the radar, even more deeply than Osama bin Laden. So the fact that his family, suddenly resurfaced uh, in the capital of Afghanistan was a major breakthrough. And this was incredible detective work by the CIA, going back not just months, but 21 years. Teams of people worked for years on this, patiently gathering intelligence that culminated in that precise strike over the weekend, Joe. So, Maura, we know the Taliban's been in charge of Afghanistan since the botched U.S. troop withdrawal last year. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has criticized the group for sheltering the leader of al-Qaeda. What else is Secretary Blinken saying? Well, we're seeing a lot of frustration from the Secretary of State because we all remember that somewhat chaotic exit from Afghanistan last year and a lot of uncertainty around what uh, that would become of the Taliban in the area, right? And so Secretary Blinken uh, releasing a statement overnight criticizing uh, the Taliban, saying, by hosting and sheltering the leader of al-Qaeda in Kabul, the Taliban grossly violated the Doha agreement and repeated assurances to the world that they would not allow, allow Afghan territory to be used by terrorists 
terrorists to threaten the security of other countries. They also betrayed the Afghan people and their own stated desire for recognition from and normalization with the international community. Now, a senior administration official said that Taliban Haqqani Network leaders did know of uh, his presence there in Kabul. And so this just proves uh, to be more problematic for relations with the Taliban and the U.S. going forward, Joe. And, you know, Ken, the Biden administration obviously is touting this as a major victory. Help us understand how much influence did al-Zawahiri and al-Qaeda really have in recent times, especially with the emergence of other organizations like ISIS? Well, U.S. officials, intelligence officials have been saying for years now that al-Qaeda lacked, no longer had the capacity to mount a complex attack on the United States, nor does ISIS, for that matter. The international terrorism has really diminished as a threat in the face of other challenges. But this is significant because um, many people believe this sort of proves the case that the U.S. can respond, quote unquote, over the horizon in Afghanistan. This was a strike conducted with, according to U.S. officials, no Americans on the ground. So all done with satellites and signals intelligence and human sources. It's, it's rather remarkable that they did it. Now, as Mora was pointing out, it's also, it also underscores, though, that al-Qaeda leaders came back into Afghanistan after the United States pulled out. So many Republicans today are criticizing that and saying it was a huge mistake to get out of there. But in terms of how uh, Biden is framing it, uh, it's a victory because they were able to conduct this strike from a distance, and he says they'll continue to do that as they need to in Afghanistan. All right, Maura and Ken, thank you for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. Let's now bring in retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitty. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. First off, just with that backdrop, who he was to this organization, and also with those details Ken gave about how difficult it was to track him down, I'm wondering your reaction to this announcement. Well, great to be on the show. First of all, this is an extraordinary victory by the members of our counterintelligence community. If you go back uh, to 1998, uh, Alzir was responsible for the bombings of the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania, the U.S. Embassy in Uganda. He was responsible and the mastermind behind the bombing of the USS Cole. And of course, he was one of the masterminds of the bombing of 9-11. Uh, and so very extraordinary. We've been trying to capture him or kill him for over 20 years. So this is a great day for our country. In recent years, how dangerous has he, have al-Qaeda been to the West, especially when you compare it with other groups like ISIS? Yes, well, make no mistake about it. Yes, they have been fractured, but they're still dangerous. They still have about anywhere between 30,000 to 50,000 members. They're all over the globe. Uh, very much so in Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. And so they still have the ability to reach out and touch and do harm across U.S. interests and across our allies. And oh, oh by the way, what we must uh, watch out for in the coming days is they, they will probably install a new leader here in the next coming days, mm -hmm. and you can look for them to try and retaliate for this attack. Now, this drone strike is the first known U.S. intervention in Afghanistan since that chaotic troop withdrawal last year. Now, we know the Taliban, of course, has been in charge since then. But as we were just discussing, the U.S. has now accused them of, of breaking an agreement to not allow any extremist groups to operate there. Are you concerned that groups like al-Qaeda, any other extremist groups could flourish again there? And is there anything we can do to stop that? Well, absolutely, I'm concerned. Uh, you know, the Taliban is complicit. If uh, he was hiding the monster mitts there in downtown Kabul, then we know that they're mm. complicit. And I am concerned that there will be other terrorist groups that may continue to brew within Afghanistan. This over-horizon capability that the U.S. put together, we have to stand by that, behind that, make sure that we have the good intelligence that we need, the SIGINT, the HUMINT, all the intelligence that we need to bring to bear Given that we don't have U.S. troops on the ground, we have to rely on this capability now. Lieutenant General Twitty, we always appreciate your time and your expertise. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. Now to the latest on the floods devastating communities in eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. This morning, flood alerts still remain in effect in both states as the rain continues to fall. Some areas are already seeing two inches of rain just this morning. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir says at least 37 people have been killed in the floods. 
while hundreds more are still unaccounted for. President Biden has approved a major disaster declaration for Kentucky, but the road to recovery could be long. Entire towns are still submerged, others completely cut off, and more rain is still on the way. We have team coverage this morning. We're going to check in with NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman in just a moment. But we begin on the ground with NBC News correspondent George Solis, who joins us now from Jackson, Kentucky. George, so the real concern this morning, they got more rain overnight. More is expected today. That raises the threat of even more flooding. What's the situation like there right now? Yeah, good morning, Joe. There is some cautious optimism that the worst is over, but only just. You can imagine many are still heartbroken over the destruction they are seeing over the loss of life. Unfortunately, it's a number that continues to increase. As you mentioned, 37 lives lost, and unfortunately, that number is expected to go higher. There's also hundreds that are still unaccounted for and even hundreds more that are displaced. As you can see, the river behind me right now, there is a swift moving current. We've been watching debris that has been flowing from homes, people's property. They've lost everything. And this morning, we are expecting an update from the governor in about an hour to give us some new numbers. So, George, yeah. I mean, these floods and rains, they've been going on for days now. On top of all the de destruction, on top of the loss of life. I mean, this is an ongoing trauma for this community. How are people coping right now mentally? Yeah, Joe, you can imagine it is a lot to ask of people right now to process what they are seeing, what they have been going through. Many people in many instances have lost everything. Some people at this point are still waiting to be rescued. The National Guard on the scene doing everything they can to get those people out of harm's way before any of those waters move in, even as waters start to recede. The heat, another concern as the temperatures start to rise here. Now, I did speak with a grandmother who walked me through her harrowing experience surviving this flood. It is truly heartbreaking. Take a listen. It came pouring into the doors, and we had like five minutes to get out, and it flooded over five feet. We took everything we had, and I've been there eight years. I'm so sorry. So you lost everything? Yeah, everything. We lost everything. Our clothes. I couldn't even get out. You said it's just you and your two grandchildren? Yeah. Where are you staying now? We've been sleeping in the car. Mother, very thankful to have made it out with her two grandchildren, and we are expecting to hear more stories of this throughout the day. But again, people here just in a show of support and solidarity. I want to ask you more about that. I mean, we know time and time again, the worst brings out the best in people. And we keep hearing how this community is rallying together to help those in need. What are some of the things you're hearing from the people there in eastern Kentucky? Yeah, Joe, people more united than ever. People here resilient, and they are showing that. Just yesterday, we noticed a number of pop-up groups handing out food and water, complete strangers, one group from about two hours away here, just making it a point to help out their fellow neighbors. They don't know anybody here. They just said they had to do something. So they gathered food. They've been collecting donations from the community and everyone eager to help out. Some of these gestures and making people emotional, understandably. Take a listen. Everybody is in this together right now. Yeah, and it's times like this we need to pull together yeah. like we're doing and, and help one another. Because that's all we have is to lean on one another right now. Are you proud of your community, proud of the people of Kentucky? I love Eastern Kentucky. They're, they're the best people. I'm sorry. We're going to help each other. We're going to be strong. Eastern Kentucky people are strong. Um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Again, it's just so heartbreaking to hear what these people have been through today. As the sun comes up, more cleanup expected to begin, more search efforts underway. Something the governor mentioned that I want to note today, he mentioned cell phone service, which is so crucial, is starting to return here in the area, which they hope will hopefully lead to more reunions in the coming days. Right. Joe and Savannah. That's, that's a little bit of good news right there. George Solis, thank you so much. Appreciate it.
For more now, we're joined by John May. He's the chief of the Wolf County Search and Rescue Team. John, thank you so much for joining us this morning and just incredible work you are doing. We so appreciate your time. I know you're working hard. I mean, first, I just want to ask what this experience has been like for you. This is, of course, one of the most important pieces here, search and rescue, the search for human life. What have you been seeing firsthand? Yeah, well, thanks for uh, inviting me on. Um, it's certainly been a difficult few days here in eastern Kentucky. Uh, we received the phone call uh, around 4.30 a.m. on uh, Thursday morning uh, that a large flooding event had occurred in Breathitt County. So we dispatched our team and, you know, we didn't have much damage here. So I really wasn't sure how bad it was going to be. But, you know, once we arrived on the scene, we met up with uh, some of the Breathitt County uh, search and rescue team members and the river was you know, unbelievable. I mean, it was it was rolling, uh, large debris coming down the river, uh, just really, really scary. And uh, we knew we were going to be in, you know, for a long day, a well, long several days and weeks, honestly. I have to ask you about this dramatic rescue video posted by your team. A lot of people have probably seen this now. I know you were involved with this effort. It shows an 83-year-old woman who's being plucked up from the roof of a home by a helicopter. I understand you were one of the rescuers who got that woman to safety by entering her home and getting her to the roof. There it is. There's that video. Tell us what that was like. How did you do this? Walk us through the process of getting people out in situations like this where it has to be from their roofs. Sure, absolutely. This was about the third or fourth rescue operation that we did that morning. So it kind of gives you an idea about how deep the water was around these homes. Uh, in this particular case, when the call came in, they advised that there was five residents stranded in the attic. Uh, so we grabbed the chainsaw off of our uh, search and rescue vehicle and put it in our boat and, and started up, you know, it was about two and a half, three miles up the river. So it wasn't easy to get to. Uh, trying to gain access there while dodging homes and trailers floating down the river. Uh, you know, we had to get into the wooded areas many times with our Zodiac uh, to avoid that. But once we got on scene, uh, there was another, actually another house right next door that had uh, two small children in it as well that we were having to deal with. But um, the Blackhawk came in um, and we, we, they lowered a medic uh, down to the roof of the house. And um, we were trying to get them out of a hole, like a vent in the attic, but uh, due to their age and the height of that hole, they couldn't come out. So we took our boat to the back side of the home and actually knocked out uh, a large window and cleared all the glass and debris from that. And then asked those residents one at a time just to come down, come down to a lower level and come to that window and we would pull them into our rescue boat. Uh, so we did that multiple times, uh, and then we would drive them basically up the side of the house and then let them climb up the roof to where you can see the, uh, the crewman from the uh, Kentucky National Guard sitting there. And it was a slick roof. I mean, we were nervous about people climbing up a tin roof, you know, and they were barefoot. So uh, we had a safety line set up, but it was it was a little unnerving. Wow. What is that moment like when you have actually been able to make it in and make contact with somebody who has been stranded there? What's it like when you're able to get them out? Yeah, just thankful we could get to them. Um, you know, there was, I, they were relatively, that was a, that was a large home, a brick home. Um, you know, so I felt pretty good about their safety, about that house not coming off the foundation mm -hmm. at that particular time. But, you know, some of the other homes that we got to uh, just before this one, uh, there was a mobile home that was completely flooded over. Uh, and the two residents were, you can see a guy wire coming off that uh, telephone pole right there. They were actually hanging on to a guy wire just like that, uh, up to their neck in water. Um, you know, we just grabbed them and pulled them into the boat. Um, you know, the lady was hypothermic, uh, shivering, very cold. Uh, the gentleman had a fairly large laceration on his arm from floating debris. And um, you just kind of do it and then you repeat it. You know, you take those people to shelter and then you go back up the river, fight your way back up and try to find the next family. And, um, you know, the National Guard was hovering overhead. We can't thank them enough. I mean, they were kind of helping us point out where we needed to go. And then if we found someone like this, you know, they, they came in and took them out, which was safer than us taking them back down the river, you know, because it was, it was pretty dicey up and down that river for certain. John May, incredible work you are doing. It sounds like such a coordinated effort that you guys are all working through here to save these families. That video is just stunning and, and just imagining you living it. Thank you so much for joining us. We so appreciate your yeah. time this morning. No Good problem. Luck Thanks with your for having me on. Absolutely. Have a good day.
You too. Incredible stories just playing out over and over again. And the threat of flooding still continues for parts of Kentucky this morning with strong storms still sweeping through the area. Yeah, for more on that and what you can expect in your forecast, we're going to check in, of course, with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning. So good to see you guys. And yeah, we're watching that flood risk continuing. We're looking at really heavy downpours. I've been watching them since 1 a.m. and they sort of pop up. They have really uh, heavy rain with them. So let's take a look at what's happening right now. We have a flood watch. That's in uh, parts of eastern Kentucky, also southern Ohio, into West Virginia, also portions of western Virginia. Now, the good news is right now we're looking dry in portions of eastern Kentucky. That's what we expect for today. We may see another round of rain tonight and then a little break tomorrow before rain returns on Thursday. But we're looking at really heavy rain moving through Illinois into portions of Indiana. Also, the western part of West Virginia. Look how heavy that rain is. It pops up really fast. We do a flash flood warnings. That's where you're seeing the red boxes. And that's going to come in and out as we go throughout the day. Uh, we do expect this to die down somewhat uh, before we see some more storms later on today. So we're expecting some flooding. We're expecting the chance of some flash flooding as well. Where you see this pink, that's your moderate risk. So that's the highest risk. And that's because we're seeing those really heavy downpours where you see those green, uh, reds, the oranges, the yellows, especially that purple color. We're seeing really strong storms and really, really heavy downpours. Again, it's like that sponge that you squeeze out. And this is just moving off to the south and also the east. Now, by this afternoon into the evening hours, we're watching another round of storms moving back to the upper Midwest. We're expecting winds gusting to 60 miles per hour. Could see some damaging hail. Could even see a tornado. That risk is low, but it's still there. We saw a tornado yesterday, a possible tornado in portions of West Virginia. Uh, the National Weather Service will go out and examine that today. But again, we're expecting a lot of rainfall once again, especially again where you see those darker colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellow. So big rapids down to Fort Wayne, Indianapolis, you could see some heavy rainfall. Now we need to talk about the dangerous heat because George sort of touched upon this, but a lot of people in Kentucky still do not have power. They don't have air conditioning. And we're really going to start to heat things up, especially in the middle of the country today. And then this is going to move off to the east by tomorrow. Even New York City, you're going to be into the upper 90s by Thursday. Boston, you're going to be close to 100 degrees. So 25 million people under a heat alert that's stretching from Minneapolis. You're under excessive heat warning through Omaha, Wichita, Tulsa, into Little Rock, where you see the orange. That is your heat advisory. We're looking at temperatures once again climbing into the 90s, into the triple digits. You factor in that humidity because it's high again. That's what's adding to some of these storm totals. We're looking and we're going to feel like 102 in Minneapolis, feeling like 108 today in Omaha. It's going to feel like 101 in Nashville. Then as we go throughout tomorrow, notice this moves off a little bit to the east. So now you get into Richmond feeling like 96. And then I'll end it quickly here because I want to show you Thursday. We're going to really heat up in the East Coast, New York City, 96, and Boston. You're going to be near 100 degrees at 99. Mm -hmm. You factor in the humidity, it's going to feel worse than that. Talk right. to you guys. It's coming back. All right. Yeah. All right. Lots to keep watching for. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Shifting to politics now, it's primary day across the country. Voters in several key swing states are set to make their voices heard as November's midterms near. That also means set cute election music. Election music, there it is. <laughs> Today, five states are holding elections with issues like abortion access on the ballot. Plus, could the January 6th hearings have any impact on key primary races? NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray joins us now with a preview. Mark, good morning. So we've seen candidates in both Arizona and Missouri's GOP Senate primaries competing for endorsements from former President Trump. We've seen throughout this primary season, sometimes that endorsement pays off, sometimes it doesn't. In those two states, how important is that endorsement, do you think? You know, Joe, in those two states, it probably does help more than it hurts. And usually where it has actually helped are in open races. We did see where Donald Trump's endorsement and intervention in that backfiring in Georgia when he was trying to run against Republican Governor Brian Kemp. But in this race, that uh, in Arizona governor, for example, to succeed uh, term-limited Governor Doug Ducey, it's an open contest, and, and Trump has thrown uh, uh, his endorsement for Carrie Lake, a former TV anchor who's very conservative. And then also in Arizona Senate, we've seen him endorse Blake Masters. Uh, and in Missouri, but I, but I also, Joe, it's important to sometimes note this Trump endorsement game can be a little bit of a farce. There have been times where Donald Trump has rescinded his endorsement. There have been times where he's endorsed only at the very end when it looks like someone's going to win. 
And then yesterday, Donald Trump decided to endorse Eric, <laughs> Eric in general in Missouri, uh, either Eric Greitens or Eric Schmidt, the <laughs> attorney general from Missouri, kind of hedging his bets there. And so sometimes when we kind of try to talk about the power of Donald Trump's endorsement, it sometimes is kind of a pointless e exercise because he's just endorsing just Eric in general. And uh, we have to kind of guess which Eric he's actually referring so, to. So do, so do the Eric's. They're guessing, too. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a good one. <laughs> All right, Mark, um, let's talk about issues here. In Kansas, we're seeing something really important play out. Voters will be the first in the country there to have a say on abortion access at the state level after Roe v. Wade was overturned. What should people know about this constitutional amendment that's set to be decided on in today's election? Yeah, Savannah, in 2019, uh, Kansas's uh, state Supreme Court ruled that there was a right to an abortion uh, in the state. And once Republicans ended up padding their majorities after the 2020 elections, the state put this uh, ballot referendum, a constitutional amendment, on the ballot for August. And it's important to note that they did it in August and not the general election, where some observers actually think this actually helps the side uh, that wants to restrict abortion rights. And on the referendum for this constitutional amendment, either you vote yes, and that is to have a new constitutional amendment that says that there is not a right to abortion in the state uh, constitution, or you end up voting no, that I want to keep it uh, the status quo as is. The no sides are the abortion rights supporters, the yes sides are the abortion rights opponents. Um, and it really has turned into a very big and close battle. And this might be the most important contest we watch all night tonight. And Mark, you know, the fallout from the January 6th hearings is lingering over all this, not to mention really last year's impeachment vote. So in Washington state, you've got two House Republicans. They voted to impeach former President Trump. They're now facing primary challengers. What are you watching for in those races? Yeah, in addition into Washington State, Joe, you also have in, uh, in Michigan where another uh, Republican incumbent who ended up voting for Donald Trump's impeachment, Peter Myers, also receiving a Trump back challenge as well. So it's a total of three. But in Washington State, it's really interesting because you end up have Jamie Herrera Butler, the Republican Congresswoman, as well as Dan Newhouse, as you mentioned, are both receiving primary challenges. But in Washington State, it's a little bit interesting. They have a top two primary system. And so so the top two candidates, regardless of party, ended up advancing in the November election. And so while they're getting these challenges from these Trump-backed candidates, it's most likely we're not going to see that resolution until November, that you end up having these members of Congress in Washington who voted for the impeachment advance to the general election against the Trump-backed opponent. All right, Mark Murray, breaking it all down for us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.